uh, he deftly calls into question the uh, supremacy of the current status quo by reminding us that there's been a reversal of the paradigm um, and he emphasizes that we had a free capital movement under the gold standard, that that uh, radically reversed to capital controls under Bretton Woods in order to provide the space for Keynesian stimulus following the Great Depression. Then it reversed back toward opening. The recent peak of this pendular swing came in the 1997 attempt to rewrite the rules of the IMF to enshrine capital openness, which was exquisitely ill-timed to coincide with the initial phase of the East Asian financial crisis. Danny sounds remarkably nostalgic for the days of Bretton Woods, despite its unsustainability because of the Triffin paradox that as other countries built up their reserves with dollars, the United States became increasingly implausibly dependent on an external deficit. And the excessive Keynesian pessimism about ex flexible exchange rates that was an underpinning of the arrangement. I was impressed to learn in this book that the move to what is now almost universal free movement of capital in the industrial countries uh, was uh, given a big boost of momentum from a very peculiar source, the French socialists. Mitterrand's experiment in, quote, socialism in one country in 1981 prompted so much capital flight through over and under invoicing of trade, uh, despite mechanisms of currency controls that reached all the way down to a little exchange booklet that each traveler had to carry, that by 1983, the French relaxed capital controls and moved toward the US-UK camp, favoring open capital markets. The central theme of Danny's vision is that free market orthodoxy can cause undue damage and should be replaced by considerable national latitude that reflects nationally divergent needs and tastes. To sharpen the point, in effect, Danny wants to make the world safe for politicians like the 1987 Minister of Agriculture in Japan, who argued that Japan could not import beef because in Japan, human intestines are longer than in other countries. My central problem with this vision is that it ignores the reality that today's global economy has about three dozen economies accounting for 90% of global product at market exchange rates. And these economies interact in what amounts to a positive sum repeat game constructed around the central dynamic of reciprocity. Danny's different strokes for different folks sounds plausible enough when you're considering whether a small, a small poor African country should be allowed to experiment with infant industry protection. It is surely implausible when asking whether there needs to be symmetry and reciprocity among such economies as the G7 on the one hand and the BRICS on the other. In particular, Danny's application of the argument to China seems misguided. He states that China needs an undervalued exchange rate to make up for its loss of autonomy and in industrial policy suffered when China joined the WTO. Otherwise, its growth rate would fall by two percentage points. But part of the reciprocity deal in the WTO was precisely that under Article 15, China would not, quote, frustrate the intent, quote, of its new obligations by engaging in, quote, exchange measures. It's implausible that a shift from foreign to domestic demand in China would damage growth and reduce employment. On the contrary, one would expect a shift toward domestic demand to be more labor intensive. And it's even more unlikely that China would sacrifice democracy as a consequence 
uh, in his democracy trilemma. A major problem with Danny's treatment of financial globalization is the tendency to attack straw men. He proposes that developing countries should have, quote, policy space for them to manage international capital flows and prevent sudden stops in overvalued currencies, quote. But where has it been written that they're not permitted to do so already? Indeed, Danny could claim victory and proclaim that the new IMF orthodoxy provides an official blessing to precisely this kind of flexibility. There are no WTO penalty-like penalties against capital controls. Just ask China or Brazil. At best, his approach says that the current rules, or the current non-rules, should be preserved into the future. It is Danny's cavalier dismissal of gains from financial globalization that is the most troubling to me. He cites the case of China, a growth champion, despite its tight capital controls. Perhaps a 40 to 50 percent national savings rate generated by China's unusually high retained corporate earnings contributed more to this outcome, however, than capital controls. He ignores the preponderant findings in the empirical literature that when there are statistically significant results, they systematically show positive rather than negative effects of financial openness on growth. As I showed in my book last year, of the dozen or so leading econometric studies, only one half of one study, Sebastian Edwards' income threshold case, has a statistically significant negative effect. The others have positive. The chance of this happening on a random basis is 300 to 1. Even if the statistically insignificant results in this literature are put in in a formal way into the overall averaging using the technique called meta-analysis or inverse variance weighting, it turns out that there's still a positive contribution going from complete closeness to complete openness of 1.5% per year growth. Danny emphasizes boom-bust cycles with sudden stops. It turns out that the banking crises and currency crises have actually tended to be more frequent among emerging market economies that have more closed capital markets than vice versa. And if you do a, a, a simulation exercise where you take a range of damages and probabilities of the change in the probability from openness versus closeness, uh, as I did in my book, I found that the chances were about 20 to 1 in favor of the secular benefits from financial globalization outweighing the expected losses from crises, applying a range of damage estimates from such authors as Ken Rogoff, Carmen and Vincent, Carmen and Vincent Reinhardt, and Hutchison and Noy. Finally, it seems to me that the book is especially off track when Danny implies that in order for some countries such as the United States to have more rigorous capital adequacy rules for banks in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, it will be necessary to control capital movements. We already know that the Swiss will have considerably higher capital requirements, yet no one thinks that it will suddenly be necessary for Switzerland to impose capital con controls as a consequence. Danny may be right that Basel III will be watered down to the least common denominator. The proper conclusion, however, is that Switzerland and the United States may appropriately impose additional screens on foreign financial firms before permitting them to operate in our territories, and not that the United States and Switzerland will need to impose capital restrictions. In sum, Danny's book deserves to be widely read and debated, and I have every confidence that it will be. Thank <laughs> you.